Writing Out Loud. A program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is music legend Jim Halsey. Thanks so much for being here, Jim. Thanks, Teresa. Glad to be back with and, you. And you've got a great new book out, Star oh, Maker. You. When you were growing up in Independence, little boy there, what stars did you listen to on the radio? Well, of course, up there I listened to Bob Wills and his <laughs> Texas Playboys over at KVOO in Tulsa, yeah. broadcast every noon, and Gene Autry, and uh, that. But my musical interests were always toward big bands and jazz, yeah. even as a young person. Yeah. So I have a very eclectic taste. I like every kind of music. Yeah. Did you ever think about becoming a performer yourself? No. Well, maybe I played in a dance band in <laughs> high school, and I thought, well, maybe I will do this. But uh, between my high school graduation and when I started college, I took that summer and I went around and I saw some really great bands. Yeah. Duke Ellington, Count yeah. Basie, oh. Lionel Hampton, Woody Herman, Stan Kenton. I realized right then if I lived to be a thousand, <laughs> I'd never be a good enough musician to play in those kind of bands. What was your instrument? Saxophone. Oh, are you a pretty good sax player? No. No? No. no. Do you ever play now? Not anymore. Melissa, my wife, bought me a clarinet a few years ago. And once in a while, I get it out, and, but just don't have time. How did you make the transition from being a music lover to being a talent broker? Well, I wanted to be in the music business, so I knew that I wasn't going to be a player. So there, at that time, there really you didn't know what was available in the business. But I saw these guys that looked important around the bands, and they were the managers. <laughs> now, Roy Clark tells the story that I pulled up beside one of these uh, shows behind the auditorium and here's the bus and all the musicians getting off and tired in the bus and going in and getting ready to start their concert and next to it was this brand new shiny Cadillac and according to Roy I said well who's that Cadillac belong to? They said that's the band manager. Oh. So he claims Maybe it's true, I don't remember, but he claims that that's the way that I decided to be a manager. <laughs> but it kind of was. I wanted to be, I was always interested in selling and marketing, selling something and promoting. And I loved the promotion business, and that's the way I started in uh, 1949, mm -hmm. October 1949, yeah. you know, uh, with Leon McAuliffe from Tulsa. You use the term manager, but you're known as an impresario. What's the distinction? I think the distinction is that if you've been a manager a long time, they'll call you an impresario. <laughs> you've represented some of the all-time greats, and I wondered if you'd give us your quick take on Reba McIntyre. Well, she was very focused on what she wanted to do. She had success, and she wanted to be successful, and uh, we were very fortunate to work with her. We, we took her to her first New York appearance. Uh, we helped present her at Carnegie mm -hmm. Hall, and we helped present her at Universal Amphitheater. So she knew where she wanted to go, and she's certainly gotten there. James Brown. Mr. James Brown. I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, he, he was all, all these people that we're talking about all had a dedicated focus, and he was the hardest working man in show business. No kidding. Right. Roy Clark. Well, Roy is what you see is what you get. He's a big ball of fun and a <laughs> twinkle in his eye and a smile and a little mischief and uh, you know we're still working together he and I got our first together in uh, 1959 when Wanda Jackson hired him as her guitar player mm -hmm. and then we've had this great career together all since then. Wanda Jackson? Well Wanda was another one of those a great songwriter and Hank Thompson was her mentor and Hank had that perfect uh, diction and pronunciation of every word that you didn't have any trouble understanding. Wanda learned that from Hank and of course she went on to became a, a big star and still is mm -hmm. inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. Mm -hmm. Wow. Incredible. And then yeah. the Oak Ridge Boys. Well the Oak Ridge Boys are family. So the Oak Ridge Boys and Roy you know are family and uh, we've been together for 35 years and while there are four distinct guys they make great harmony on stage, mm. and they all have their own uh, likes and, and wants and, and focuses, but they are very dedicated to their audience, their fans, 
and to the music. Jim, we all know people who have beautiful voices, and yet for one reason or another, they do not make it in show business. What makes a star? Well, sometimes it's being ahead of the times, sometimes it's being behind the times, but it's that uniqueness that a person has in their performance. Uh, maybe it's a glitch in the voice, a twinkle in the eye, a smile, a wink, or whatever it is that is memorable. In a song, it's called the hook, mm -hmm. and the performer has the hook as well, too. Did you ever pass on anybody who went on to be a big star? Oh, probably. I didn't pass on them, but uh, Vince Gill was telling me a few years ago, and said, you know, I tried to get in to see you for so long, and I never could, never could get past the reception. And I said, well, I'm sorry about that because I think you're one of the greatest performers <laughs> in our business. So, and, and who knows, uh, you, you know, what? Uh, I was in on the very beginning of Elvis's career. That must have been exciting. Did you have any idea he was going to be the star he was? Well, other people did. And I was actually in the Army, but I was booking Hank Thompson through uh, southern Louisiana. This is 1954, yeah. 55. And, and I needed an opening act, and this friend of mine, Leo Zabelin, said, you ought to hire this kid on the Louisiana Hayride, Elvis Presley. Yeah. And I said, you know, I don't even know what he sounds like, but I love the name. <laughs> so uh, Hank actually hired Elvis for six days, paid him $300 a night, wow. and he came out and opened for Hank and just drove the audience crazy. Well, what are some of the biggest myths about Elvis? Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Elvis uh, was always very polite and uh, genuine to me. And I don't know uh, what other stories are around about him, but I can't say anything bad about Elvis because it never happened when we were dealing or talking. Yeah, well, that seems to be the story that emerges, that in spite of all of his fame and success, he was really a pretty down-to-earth southern country boy. Yeah. You mentioned your own eclectic tastes in music, and you've manage a wide variety of artists, everybody from the Glenn Miller Orchestra to Roy Orbison. What's your favorite Roy Orbison story? Well, I wanted to introduce Roy behind the Iron Curtain. So uh, I was uh, helping produce a festival in Bulgaria, Sunny Beach, Bulgaria. And we had this opportunity to take Roy Orbison there as the featured headliner for that festival. It drew, it drew people from all over Eastern Europe, mainly. So I explained to him, he said, yes, I'd like to go. So we get in the plane, you got on the plane in Nashville, and you go to New York, you go to London, you go to Madrid, you, you, you go to someplace else and change. And finally, after about two days of traveling, we're in uh, sunny beach, Bulgaria, near, <laughs> near Varna. And everybody's just dead tired when we get off the plane. And he looked over at me, he said, Halsey, where are we? And I said, Roy, you're in sunny beach, Bulgaria. He said, Bulgaria? I thought you said we were going to Bavaria. <laughs> now, I don't know whether he was kidding. He never told me. But, but he wowed him in Bulgaria, all these Eastern European hard-nosed communists out there, thousands of people screaming and yelling for him. He was a magical artist. Did that surprise you, the response you got? Oh, not at all. Not with him. And then you took tours to the, to the Soviet Union. Yes. Well, before that, we took Roy Clark. We, we've taken the Oak Ridge Boys. And, and so it's, we had, uh, at that time, I was president of an international festival organization that was part of UNESCO. Mm -hmm. So I was involved in all the festivals all around the world. And that opened the doors for us to go to places like the Soviet Union, to, to Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, uh, Poland, uh, you know, places that normally didn't have Western performers. Mm -hmm. Roy Clark and the Oak Ridge Boys were the first country music artists to ever headline a tour in the Soviet Union. And it was just gangbusters. It was tremendous. And we got the word that it was not only culturally successful, but diplomatically successful as well, too. Which had to be important to you because of your work with UNESCO. It was, yes. And your two trips to the Soviet Union were 12 years apart. Did right. you see a difference the second time? We went? did, and, and my wife, Manisa, took a, a Native American art show there. And it was the first Native American art show that, uh, that was there for nine months in three different cities. What are some of the misconceptions we had about the Soviet Union at that time? 
oh, that we thought that they were going to bomb us any moment. Mm -hmm. We get over there, and all the Soviets thought uh, we were going to bomb them. You know, and there's where Roy Clark and the Oaks made a tremendous difference. They saw it was a very cold audience the first night until about 15 minutes into the show, and Roy Clark and the Oak Ridge Boys warmed up that cold. So by cold, I mean it's 25 below zero yeah. too. Yeah. But they were there and say, "Okay, Americans, entertain us," and they did, and they made friends. How did you handle the language barrier? Well, uh, we had interpreters. And then some of them, you know, you learn enough to mm -hmm. talk about food and, and where to go. But when Roy was singing, for example, did you have translators there? Um, we did, but so much of his, in music, you don't really need that so much because they understand the, the words some way, they feel the words, and it's the music that... That carries, carries that. So there's truth to the cliche that music is the universal language. Absolutely, it certainly is. You now do not handle the booking agency so much anymore. No. So much anymore, and you're focusing at this stage in your career on helping aspiring, aspiring right. musicians. I'm still in the management business, and I managed uh, the Oaks and the, and the Oak Ridge Boys, and of course Roy Clark. We've been together for a long time, 